All right, it's February 28, 2016. We're at a, another Boston Hydrocephalus meeting on Hydrocephalus. Tom Poss from Medtronic, Director of Marketing for Medtronic and Neurosurgery will be presenting to us everything you wanted to know about Hydrocephalus. We have a great turnout. People are getting ready. Welcome anybody to join us. We'll be starting in a couple minutes. Stand like here, so that they can see the slides and Sure. And then I could just um, come over and change the slide. Also, we introduce. <laughs> So I just want to um, welcome everyone for coming. Uh, we have a couple Talk loud. new faces here, so we're so thrilled that um, you've joined us today. Um, I'm most excited to welcome Tom from Medtronic, all the way out here from California. So thank you, Tom. And we're excited. Um, we did this a couple years ago. Had, it from, had someone talking about shunts, and you guys really appreciated it. And so we asked Tom to come and share his knowledge and experience with us. And he's got um, back there all the shunt tubings and valves, and so you can do it hands-on with that. Um, I just wanted to share a quick, quick story. It was just kind of um, ironic how this transpired. My husband and I, you know, quick stop someplace for lunch um, in between commitments from what we had this morning to on our way to the meeting here this afternoon. And we met some friends and they asked where we were heading to this afternoon. I said, oh, we're going to a meeting um, for the Hydrocephalus Association. We're gonna learn about shunts. And um, my friend Jen proceeded to tell me how her father-in-law um, was just diagnosed with normal pressure and hydrocephalus. Um, for a year, he had just been told that he had dementia, and he had been incontinent and dementia, and but they never checked for hydrocephalus. And so, um, just recently, uh, they realized he had hydrocephalus, they put in a shunt, and he is back to what he was before the dementia. And so, I'm so thankful for shunts, I'm thankful for even um, all the work that the hydrocephalus uh, puts in into funding research and, and this, all the new innovative ideas that are out there and from Medtronic and everything that they're doing. So um, I do want to let you know that um, this meeting is being uh, live webcast. It's, we're kind of a trial in it to see how it's going to work. Um, I do want to let you know that when you ask questions, your face will not be on the video. It's just focused <laughs> on Tom and the screen. <laughs> Um, so, but, so I do encourage you to ask questions and not be intimidated because Brian is here recording it. It will just be your voice, no faces on there, okay? Um, any questions before we start? Can I turn it over to Tom? Okay, there are snacks over there, so feel free to- And restrooms are right outside as well, so Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. It's, uh, I appreciate you uh, asking me to come here, and, and hopefully, I can share some information with you that helps educate you about shunts and hydrocephalus and, and um, the technology behind it. So that um, I always think that when you have a good understanding of the technology that you're exposed to, you have it helps you better diagnose maybe what's going wrong with it or what's going right with it. And, and in the end, when you're working with your physician um, partner. 
sometimes you're the, you're a great source of information to help them understand what's going on with your loved one that's that's leveraging this uh, technology. So um, I think this is about it's 45 minutes long. So hopefully it doesn't uh, take too much longer and and have some time for questions afterward. I know a lot of you already had some questions and. It's exciting to be able to help you um, understand more about uh, shunt technology. So I've been involved in this industry for about 26 years, and the last 18 have been with Medtronic, um, uh, with this business unit called CSF Management that makes uh, the shunts for treating hydrocephalus. So our facility is located out in uh, Santa Barbara, California. Uh, just about an hour north of Los Angeles, and at that facility we make over um, what is it, uh, 125,000 valves a year, which are attached to about 400,000 catheters. We make more shunts for treating hydrocephalus than any other company in, in the world. <clears throat> um, to really talk about shunt technology and hydrocephalus, I think you really have to start with talking about what CSF is and and how the system is supposed to work and what goes wrong with it. And so here's a really good diagram of the brain to help sort of explain um, cerebral spinal fluid and how it's, it's supposed to work. Obviously the yellow part is, is your brain and then the, there's these, these cavities here within your brain that are called the ventricle. This is one of your lateral ventricles. This is the third ventricle and then you can see a small pathway that goes in, down into what's called the fourth ventricle. All the brown areas on this drawing are what's called subarachnoid space. This is the space within and around your brain that's that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Um, when everything is working right, the CSF is produced by this reddish colored tissue called the choroid plexus, and it's sort of excreted by this, this tissue, and then flows through the system by virtue of these little arrows and around the brain until it reaches an area up near the top um, Near the uh, near the sagittal sinus, which is part of your venous system, the venous system is the blood that's going back to the heart to be uh, pumped through the lungs so that it can be reoxygenated. So essentially, if everything's working right, it flows through the system and gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream into the sagittal sinus. Next slide. Those little circles right there are called the arachnoid villi. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see sort of a blown up picture of, this is the top of your head, this triangular blue area is the sagittal sinus where the, um, the venous blood is flowing. And how it works is this, the bluish area here is your subarachnoid space where the cerebral spinal fluid is. It's going into these finger-like structures called the arachnoid villi. And these are like little one-way valves that enter this triangular area called the sagittal sinus. And so it goes into the venous blood and mixes with it and as your blood flows through your body and it gets to your kidneys, it's filtered out through the kidneys and that, that part of the body. Um, with each of us, we produce about a pint of CSF to each day. And so the easiest way to remember that is, you know, a kind of number of beer glasses is about a pint. And so normally, if everything's working okay, we produce a pint and we reabsorb a pint. And you have this natural, um, circulation of CSF on a daily basis. Um, it's produced at a rate of about 20 to 25 millimeters per hour. And the CSF is important. Not only does it sort of, our brain sort of float and, our spine, and surrounds our spinal cord as well, but um, and it, it provides basic nutrients to the brain. So it's important that we keep it in there. So when we start to talk about a shunt and draining it out, we want to drain out some of the fluid, but not all of it, because we need to maintain it because it's important. And so what is hydrocephalus? So we talked about what sort of works in a normal situation, but what is the situation with hydrocephalus? And it comes from the Greek word hydro and kephale, hydro, um, which is hydro is water and kephale is head. And the definition of it is an abnormal accumulation of CSF in the ventricles of the brain. And I think prior to um, me coming here, somebody there was a lot of questions that were kind of directed my way. One of the questions was, what does a normal picture of um, ventricles look like, and what does it look like when somebody has hydrocephalus? And you can see the difference there. Where the ventricles become enlarged due to the fact that the CSF continues to be produced in the middle of your head, and it doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't go through its normal circulatory paths. 
And so you'll end up with enlarged ventricles that need to be dealt with so that uh, you don't result in any damage to the brain. <clears throat> and so what are some of the symptoms of hydrocephalus? And <clears throat> if left untreated, um, a, a, and especially in infants, the head can become very enlarged. And that's due to the fact that pressure is, is rising inside the middle of your head and the ventricles, and it's essentially squeezing your brain outward. But in little babies, as you guys know, the, uh, the, the bony plates of the head haven't fused yet. They're still open. And so pressure finds the, the path of least resistance, and the head will actually get bigger. It's very rare in the United States today to find um, a child that has an extremely enlarged head. Whereas if you go to um, developing countries like Haiti or um, Latin America, those types of areas, you will come across patients that just don't get treated. And it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to see. What's great about um, developing countries is there's a, there's a very um, established practice in place to measure uh, babies' heads by our pediatricians. And if they notice any small anomalies, if the baby is a little bit uh, bigger than, than average, um, they can do further scans. They could do MRIs and see what's going on. So they catch things a lot sooner. And you know, with any type of medicine, the sooner you identify something, the better off we're able to treat it. And so the good news is, is that in, in developed countries, it's, um, it can be dealt with quicker, and the outcomes tend to be better. There's your question. Yeah, about, go ahead. Um, developing countries. Um, I'm from Trinidad, actually. And um, my son was actually, he's 14 now, and he's actually able to go last year. But when I spoke to his neurosurgeon, um, they're not able to equip with it, whether it's a pills or not. Um, so he said that they have, I guess, very basic or primitive valves, or even if they have a valve, but you know, it, there was really not no recourse for us. So um, you're saying that they're dealing with it. Do you know how they actually deal with these kids? Yeah, um, it, you know, a lot of times the, the, the governments of these developing countries only have so much money to put into healthcare, right? And they essentially divvy it up between the different disciplines of medicine. Some of it goes to cardiac care. Some of it goes to neurosurgery. And in the end, they only have a, a small budget to, to address to treat hydrocephalus, right? And so in the end, they try to make it go as far as it can go. What eventually ends up happening is there's a lot of mission trips to these areas. There's physicians from the United States and other developing countries that donate their time to go to these areas. And, and very often Medtronic donates the shunts that, that will be used in those procedures at no cost so that they can do it. But the problem is, is, is they only can do so many surgeries while they're there. There are efforts in place where, um, you know, that old saying, it's better to teach somebody to fish than it is to feed them for one day. And so there, the visiting neurosurgeons spend a lot of time trying to teach the younger um, physicians to first of all become neurosurgeons, and second of all, how to treat hydrocephalus locally. Um, with things like not only donated shunts, but um, um, endoscopic third ventriculostomies, which is another treatment for hydrocephalus that doesn't require a shunt. So those are some of the things that are happening to try and make that better than it is today. And what countries that have you guys serviced? Uh, just about anywhere around the world. Whenever a physician um, is going on one of these trips, they send a request to Medtronic or to one of the other companies. And, and so we might... I don't know the list of countries that we've helped, but all over the world. Yeah. Um, so we talk about the treatment of hydrocephalus, and obviously one of the most common things is a shunt. We talked about ETVs as well, but here to just talk a little bit more about the shunt technology. And a shunt is a really general term that says it, it's um, it's a device that that is a whole or small passageway which moves or allows movement of fluid from one part of the body to the, uh, the other. In the case of hydrocephalus, we're moving CSF as the fluid, right? But a shunt is also a tube that you put in your ear to equalize the pressure between the inner air and the outer atmosphere. So shunt is a very general term, but when you start to about, talk about a shunt for hydrocephalus, you can see this picture up here in the right-hand corner. It usually consists of three parts. You know, sometimes we call the shunt the valve portion of the device, but it's really the whole thing that's called a shunt. And it consists of, a, the number one is the ventricular catheter, number two is the valve, and number three is the peritoneal catheter, the distal catheter. And the valve serves a purpose of controlling the fluid that's going through this tubing system from the head down to the abdomen. And I'll show you a picture of really what that means. 
And the goal, again, is to drain off the excess CSF, but still leave fluid behind because it's important. We need it. It's there for a reason, and it needs to be maintained. Next slide. So this shows a nice diagram of where the ventricular catheter goes down into the ventricles of the brain. There's a valve and then a long peritoneal catheter that ends up in the abdomen. The, uh, the procedure is, as, as most of you know, is to cut through the, um, the scalp and make a, a hole in the, in the bone of the skull, push the, uh, the ventricular catheter through that, that opening until the tip of the catheter hits the, the kind of the dark areas, which are the, the fluid-filled ventricles. It's a little bit like hitting a well of water underground, right? You're driving a tube down to that well so that fluid can communicate up to the surface. The ventricular catheter is then connected to a valve, which sits on top of the skull, but under the scalp. And then a distal catheter, which runs all, just under the skin, all the way down, typically to the abdomen. They sometimes call that the peritoneal cavity. The most common type of shunt is that shunt, which I just described, which is called a VP shunt, which is short for ventriculoperitoneal. And that just means you're connecting the ventricles to the peritoneal cavity. That's the most common, probably in the order of 95% of all shunts are of that type. Occasionally, um, a physician may need to put in a VA shunt, which is a ventricular atrial, which goes into the right atrium of the heart. And the reason they would, might want to do that is because there's um, maybe issues with the peritoneum, um, an infection or something along those lines where they just want to stay away from that part of the body and then deposit the, the catheter into the right atrium of the heart. Does that schematic sort of make sense to you guys? Yeah. So why do they eat it? What, what type of uh, incidence is, exists for hydrocephalus? About one in a thousand babies is born hydrocephalic, and, and it could be due to, um, it's often due to bleeding within the ventricles, and it could be caused from the trauma of birth or other things, or congenital defects that sometimes happen. Sometimes the body doesn't form naturally. And the pathways that would normally be open for CSF to flow are obstructed in, in some way. Um, there are some, there's a subset of patients with spina bifida that will also acquire hydrocephalus as a result of that disease. In adults, it happens about 10 times less. Um, one in 10,000 patients, in adult patients, will have a late onset of hydrocephalus. And the most common way that that's referenced is called NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus. And all that means is that um, you have the symptoms of hydrocephalus, which is dementia, um, gait disturbance, and um, sometimes incontinence. Um, and as a result, um, it's, I think it's more along the lines of an exchange of fluid than it is a great deal of pressure buildup like it is in, sometimes in, in little kids. And so that's why it gets the name normal pressure hydrocephalus because you don't have this this high levels of pressure building up on the inside of the, the brain. Instead, you have normal pressures, but you have poor exchange of fluid. And they find that when you can put a shunt in, it helps the exchange happen sort of artificially. And as a result, you know, I have to say, sort of cleaning out the gunk, and um, you start to feel better. And in some cases, so you were just mentioning a patient, um, it's quite miraculous. You know, you see patients go from you know difficult gait. Um, having a hard time getting along, having a hard time living independently, and, and getting their lives back. So it's, it's really um, an amazing thing when they find the right patients for that. Um, let me go back. Yeah. So um, as I stated, one of the main reasons for hydrocephalus is what's either called obstructive or communicating. And obstructive happens about 60% of the time. And this is an obvious blockage in the pathway, the fluid pathways of the ventricular system. The physicians will look at the MRI and they'll see actual areas of the ventricular system that are clogged off. Either they've sort of grown together from what's called a natural stenosis, or there may be a fluid-filled um, cyst or tumor blocking it. Whatever the case may be, the fluid isn't flowing where it's supposed to go. In the cases of communicating hydrocephalus, it means that there, there isn't an obvious obstruction, but the fluid isn't going through its natural reabsorption mechanism. It just isn't working. In either case, you have to deal with the hydrocephalus by figuring out a different route to get the fluid out so that you can maintain normal pressures inside the patient's head. 
And so one of the one of the questions that I got prior to is what is sort of the success and failure rates of shunts? Um, it's it's very well known that shunts have a failure rate of about forty percent of the time within the first couple of years, and that's that's a sad statistic. But um, on the other hand, you know this is this is a great example of uh, families and folks that are living you know relatively normal lives to normal lives due to the fact that a shunt is is restoring people to to full health. And so our, although they are problematic, they are a life saving device. Um, the sad part about hydrocephalus is there really is no cure at this point. You're always going to need to rely on either the ETV to keep um, fluid flow communicating or some type of shunt device. And um, so it's important that we continue to, to make this technology for the market. Of that 40%, the most common failure with respect to shunts, this is supposed to be a picture that helps uh, sort of demonstrate it, is the ventricular catheter that sits in the ventricles of the brain often gets clogged with uh, body tissue. And the fluid that's supposed to be going out through the system can't get to where it needs to go. And the tissue just clogs it up. And so that's when um, you know you hear about a shunt revision. More often than not, during the shunt revision, they may only be replacing the ventricular catheter and keeping the rest of the shunt system in place. But that's one of the most common failures. This is an example of a catheter that was removed and uh, choroid plexus that's tethered to the um, tip of the catheter. And so that sort of brings us to shunt technology. So how do shunts work? And I had a chance to show a few people over at the, um, the table over there. But, but basically what you have is when you talk about the valve mechanism, it's a fairly simple device where the, the ventricular catheter is attached here and that goes down into the ventricles of your brain. And fluid comes in through this plastic connector. This is sort of a cutaway version of the valve. It goes over this little space right here and enters what's called the reservoir. That's probably the biggest thing you can feel when you when you go to palpate a shunt, and it's this soft area. It's almost like a um, you can see it better in this picture here, uh, a small little bubble area we call it the reservoir, and it it's a it provides the neurosurgeon with an access point to the inside of the system, and they can they can place a needle through this, through the scalp through the um, reservoir and take a sample of CSF for testing, oftentimes to determine whether or not there may be. Um, infectious uh, fluid or, or debris in the shunt and thus needing further treatment. It also is, a, is an opportunity to pump the shunt and direct fluid one way or the other to see if maybe there's an obstruction. It's not a real good positive way to test the shunt, but it's another piece of information that helps the neurosurgeon diagnose the shunt. This is really the smarts of the valve and what it is is um, it's a membrane and CSF that comes into this area has to push this membrane out of the way for fluid to flow through the back end of the shunt. And here you can see an example of this silicone membrane is being flexed and fluid is allowed to go by. The thickness of this membrane determines the opening pressure of the valve. <coughs> a good analogy is, you know, it's, it's a little bit like a, an umbrella, right? And we all know that if you're outside on a windy day with an umbrella, if you get in a strong enough wind, you can actually get the umbrella to bend the opposite way, right? But it takes a certain amount of force to do that. And so it takes a certain amount of force to bend that little umbrella so that fluid can go by. And if you have a thicker membrane, it takes more fluid pressure to open. And if you have a thinner membrane, it takes less. And so essentially, once fluid pressure builds up in, in, in the patient's ventricles with their head, it pushes it open, the excess fluid flows out. And then once it reaches a pressure rating lower than the flexibility of the membrane, it closes. And so it drains out the excess, but it keeps the rest of it in the ventricular system. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, is there any way to determine the pressure before you put that in so you might better choose what thickest membrane to use? Yeah, you know, the, the biggest problem that neurosurgeons have is what do you set the valve at? What what fix because these valve come these valves come in different <laughs> pressure ratings, right? So if they don't choose the right one, the downside is you'll go home, your symptoms might not be resolved, you have to come back in and replace that valve with one with a different opening pressure. There isn't always a good way to do that. One of the ways that they can do it is admit the patient into the hospital and connect what's called an external drainage system. Many of you have heard of this. It's basically the catheter still goes down into the ventricles of the brain, but it, the skin is, is sutured around it, 
and the catheter sticking out, and it's connected to a fluid drainage system. And they position it next to the, the patient's bed, and they can raise it up and down and sort of see what uh, pressures you can tolerate. By raising the system <coughs> up above the patient's head, it requires more fluid pressure to drain into the system. So they can say, um, maybe they raise it up to 20 and they say, you know, are you able to sort of tolerate that for a day's period of time or do you get headaches or symptoms? And so they sort of dial in this external drainage system to determine what your best um, operating pressure is. And then from that, they'll determine what type of valve to put in. Does that make sense? And that's one of the tools that's frequently used. Um, you mentioned that, that the, by far the most common reason for failure is blockage of the ventricular catheter. Yeah. I was just curious why they, if that's the case, why don't they put, um, you know, instead of having one singular point of operation, why not have one out and make a standard procedure to put two in so you double the chances of, of getting flow? Yeah. I'll tell you what, we, we've come up with just about every idea you can think of. And it's a great point is, first of all, um, uh, I don't have a picture here, but the, the end of the catheter has many flow holes in it, because the thought is, well, what if one of the flow holes blocks, if you only have one, if you only have a tube with a hole on one end? So that was a reason for putting lots of flow holes in the sides of the catheter. Um, it's like a perforated pipe. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's okay, you'll think of it. You, it you'll if, remember. If it is blocked, how, how would you know? Your symptoms come back? Oh. Exactly. And so, in the case of um, patients that don't have normal pressure hydrocephalus, you will see a rise in pressure without the fluid being able to drain the system. So probably start with headaches, or blurred vision, depending on each individual patient. But um, you know, it is possible to put in more than one catheter, but the system gets very complicated, and in the end. If the mechanism that's clogging the one catheter might also clog the other one. We've even gone so far as to make catheters with um, flanges that come off the ends of the catheter, trying like almost like elbows, right, to keep keep things away from it. And we find that that actually creates more surface area for things to grab onto it. It's actually worse. And so it's interesting when you start to think about ideas about how to solve these problems. Sometimes the best ideas um, have surprising results once you put it in the body. And that's the most difficult part is for, for us to test any idea. It's a very long, long road. So I remembered what, is there um, technology that's being developed that will have um, almost like a chip, some sort of computer chip in the thing that's going to monitor your ICP or at least can record it for a period of time and the, you know, the, the only ways for us to get it now, uh, if, if, if somebody does the bolt, mm -hmm. I've had that, it's yep. very uncomfortable, you know. Of course. And the other procedure that you talked about where it's externalized and, you know, three weeks with that thing next to my, yeah. do I tolerate this or am I going to throw up all over your face? Yeah. You know? um, but the, uh, now I have, um, the Escalab, and it seems like the Mika guy that's doing the design that's in his pipeline is yeah. just sort of integrated into so they can at least collect data when these shunts come out. You know what I mean? As yeah, to what exactly. The patient was going through. So I didn't know if, if that was something that, you know, was in the, like I said, in the works with in future shunts to come, mm -hmm. you know. There's a couple things that are happening. It's, it's not possible for us to hear his question. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, maybe Tom, you repeat the question. Yeah, absolutely. He was I'm asking, sorry. you know. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm a mumble. <laughs> is, I think you were asking, is it possible to incorporate sensing technology into a shunt to measure ICP, yes. flow, yeah. things like that? And yeah. yes, those things are coming. Yeah. A lot of times, we have to wait for technology to catch up with our ideas. Right. You know, the idea is it's fairly simple, right? right. But right. Uh, one of the problems with pressure sensing is um, pressure sensors, how do I explain this, um, are not very accurate once you put them inside the body. So in other words, they work great in the first day when you put them in, but they have what's called drift. And what that means is their accuracy gets 
worse and worse over time because it isn't exposed to the atmosphere to re-zero it. And so we're waiting for technology to advance to the point where the sensors are more stable so that when it's inside your body for six years and it tells you your ICP is 10, it truly is 10 and it hasn't changed. And so we're waiting for technology to get a little bit more stable. Um, I mean, I, I think something like the Bolt doesn't give me an accurate reading either because uh, all you're doing is, you know, you're lying there for three days and they're measuring your pressure. I mean, that's not what they do in a normal three days. Right, right. So, you need to see people when they're moving. lie down for three days at a time either, yeah. getting die water every 15 minutes, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, no, like, you're exactly not right. My life. So the other thing that's happening is there's some technologies to be able to measure um, ICP, intracranial pressure, non-invasively. So Zach, you talked about um, you know they have to drill a hole in your head and yeah, put a sensor down in your brain to be able to measure ICP today. Right. That's it. That's all we know. Right. Mm -hmm. There are technologies that are looking at how to how to potentially measure ICP by looking through the eye, through the ear, um, through the temporal um, window. There's, there's probably about six companies that are exploring this. The, the problem is the, the ICP values aren't very accurate at this point. Right. And so again, it's, a, it's an issue of technology sort of advancing and catching up. But I mark my words, it's coming. Pretty soon they won't have to do that. Right. I'm just, you know, I'm just back on the technology piece. I mean, they do it with the heart, like peacemakers and different things that can let you know what your heart's doing. Um, you know, with my son, he has bilateral um, bilateral shunts, VP shunts, mm -hmm. um, separately in this thing, working different from each other. Yep. So he requires both of them, and according to what they say, it's not usual. Um, but with him, when when it fails, like he just had a failure a couple of months ago, um, where concern is which one has failed, because my son does not always show on either a CAT scan or an MRI. Um, what he does do is his heart rate drops and he stops breathing on us and we know it's not working, so we've got to get him to the OR as soon as possible. Um, but it would really be good to know, I mean, you know, which one is it? I mean, yeah. they're relying on a lot. I mean, usually it's clinically clinical decision. I mean, the one thing that saved us was there was slight ventricular change on on the CAT scan. So they said, let's hit the right first to make sure. Let's just hit the right. Yeah. And if it, if it's the right fine, we got their time. Yeah, and if yeah. it's not, we'll hit the left. Yeah. So, um, but you know, I mean, you're doing it for the heart. So why can't we do something in the same kind of technology way so we can see that there's, I mean, obviously his pressure is building up. So something has got to say, listen, something's not working. Um, so if we can see that, if we, you know, I, I'm just thinking like a pacemaker type of thing. How if we can yep. do something like that? Yeah, those things are coming. And, and one of the things that you're talking about is, is pacemakers use a battery. Batteries have to be replaced, and so one of the one of the upsides is, is if you do re start to replace this, now a shunt system that you know could potentially go in and never have to be changed again in your lifetime, you'd have to have a battery in there that currently at current technology it's about every five years it would need to be replaced. So you'd have to have a surgery every five years to replace it with the current technology. But that's changing. Yeah. We're figuring out ways to inductively um, charge batteries without having to uh, take them out. But the short answer is, yes, we needed to put um, smart sensing into valves so that we can measure flow. So for instance, if in your son's case, if, if there's a flow sensor in the valve and they see that one of them is flowing and one of them's not, it may help them target the one that needs the repair instead of doing unnecessary surgery. And so those types of things will definitely come. Is this a fixed shunt? Yeah, this is an example of a fixed pressure shunt. Are you gonna show the yeah, I'll talk about the adjustable technology. Um, I had a question about um, what you were previously talking about with the, um, the ICP. Mm -hmm. um, the new technology, would you think that would be something like an MRI? Where, like, just right now there's, like, too much, like, there's an obstruction where they can't visually tell how much. Like, I don't, like, I'm trying to understand how you would be able to see the amount that is in there. To me, how, do you, how do you measure ICP non-invasively? Yes. Yeah, I didn't get into the individual uh, technology, but um, like for instance, one of the technologies is um, through the ears. It's literally a pair of headphones that you put in your ear. One of the headphones sends a, an acoustic signal across the, uh, the inside of your head. 
and by how the acoustic signal is reflected and changed as it, as it propagates through the head and then is received by the receiver, there's a very complicated algorithm that interprets what that means. And from it, it can, it can figure out what intracranial pressure is. So the technology there is an acoustic signal. There's another uh, technology that's looking through the eye, and the idea is to look at the blood vessels on the back of the eye, which are essentially connected to blood vessels inside your intracranial space. And by how much they're flexed or not flexed, they can determine the pressures in the vessel, which indirectly they can determine sort of fluid pressure in your head. And again, you're trying to figure out information from indirect information, yeah. and it's not very accurate. And so those are the big hurdles is you don't get something for nothing. Yeah. And so we, we, in some cases, we have to wait for technology to get a little bit further for it to be accurate enough to be useful. Because if you, um, like intracranial pressures might be anywhere from zero to 20 um, centimeters of water. If, if the error on your, your new ICP device is plus or minus 20, it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any informative um, value to it. And so these are some of the things they're working through. But the bottom line is, is there's companies working on it and trying to continually refine it so that, so that you can measure intracranial pressure without drilling all in somebody's head. And so the beauty of something like that would be this. Um, you know, one of your loved ones uh, is, is showing some symptoms of shunt malfunction, maybe extreme headache, but you don't know if it's just a headache or if it's truly due to shunt malfunction. If it really was shunt malfunction, you should see their ICP go up dramatically because it's not being vented the way it should be. So having a device to be able to check somebody's intracranial pressure just in a doctor's office or an emergency room would help vet those patients and determine whether it's an emergent situation or whether it's less critical. So you can start to see the value of some of those things. Another technology that's actually out on the market right now is something called um, shunt check. And maybe some of you have heard of this. It's a device that, um, that tries to determine whether there's flow in the shunt um, tract itself. So again, you can't tell by looking at a patient whether their shunt is clogged, right? And so one of the things they do is they have a series of sensors that they try to lay on the shunt track on the patient's neck, and they take um, a cooling pack, put it on top of the shunt, and what you're doing is, is if you're cooling the fluid above the fluid flow, and if it, the shunt is truly flowing, the, the cool fluid up here should eventually pass the sensors if the shunt track is open. And so it's a way to try to determine whether the shunt is flowing and patent, or whether it's truly clogged. Question? Yeah, she tried that test. I think that's why she. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like it. Uh, yeah. Hey, Tom. Yeah. We we have a we have a question from the internet because this is being live streamed on YouTube right now. Uh, can people be allergic to the type of materials um, in the different plastics? Yeah. And can that cause malfunctions or make it harder to function, creating more proteins, etc.? Hence, clogging the proximal portion, whatever that is. So uh, basically a question, yeah. are there different materials? Yeah, and it, one of the problems with silicone is um, there's essentially some impurities in it, and um, sometimes patients can be basically allergic to it. And, um, you know, what the response is to that allergy, I'm not completely sure whether it produces more proteins and causes more clogging. But it, essentially, if you, you are sort of allergic to standard shunts and the impurities in the silicone, it can cause, again, an allergic reaction, and, and you'll see some examples of sort of infection and allergic reaction and how that can be problematic. One of the things that Medtronic actually developed is, is a way to make um, silicone get rid of some of those impurities. And so for this very, very small subset of patients that have this problem, we have what's called extracted shunts. And the silicone has been uh, sort of cleaned to a, an extreme level and when they put those in those patients, they don't have the same reaction, and they're more back to a situation where the shunt functions as it properly should. Great answers. <coughs> talking all the talking all functions. Uh, my daughter Lovely, when she was younger, had a problem where the um, tubing she had a lot of calcium yeah. buildup and tissues building around it. Yeah. So it was getting stuck right in the neck section. It was pulling on the shunt. Yeah. Why why she was having such big headaches and finally broke, broke off and, yeah. and we couldn't remove it. So we had to put 
put a whole new one next to it. Uh, is there something new technology that people have found? Well, you can change the type of Robert's uh, silicone so nothing yeah. can stick to it behind it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of an unknown. Um, there's lots of different theories on it, but what it is is uh, it seems to happen where the, the, the distal catheter goes over the clavicle and where it's in contact with the bone. They think that um, uh, one explanation is it causes an irritation and, and causes the body to drive calcium to that area, and the calcium gets sort of absorbed by the silicone catheter, and it becomes brittle and calcified and almost becomes like a piece of chalk. And then once it becomes brittle, you know, if you move, it'll crack. And now you don't have a, a fluid pathway that's that's consistent anymore, continuous. Yeah, the surgeon said they wouldn't even call try and take it out. They said it would just break apart. Yeah, it's a mess. So it's not like um, a standard shunt where you can just kind of pull the whole thing out. Now it's fractured, right? Yeah. And so it's very complicated. Making an incision along the entire shunt tract is, that's a they dangerous, damage, yeah. yeah, you know, and, and, and chance for infection and, of course, a scar and all those types of things. So. Sometimes it's better to just put a new one in, but but they think that's what's causing it is is the body's reaction to it. Yeah. Whether we have a solution or not, um, there's the thought that some of our catheters, which you'll see over on the table over there, have what's called barium impregnation, and the barium is what makes it radiopaque, means you can see it on X-ray. We do have versions of our catheters that are have less barium in it, and some physicians believe that if it has less barium in it, it might calcify less. There isn't really good scientific data to prove that fact, but it's something that's sort of being explored. Yeah. On the calcification piece, I mean, do we have an, an idea of when it tends to happen? It's like when you go to puberty. It tends it to happen to worse in kids because your bones are growing. You have you have a crazy influx of calcium going throughout your body, and so it seems to happen more in, in younger children than it does in let's say adults. Nine when it grows. Yeah. The same exact thing happened to me. Same thing happened to me when I was 10. And I got a piece of tubing that's in there. Same thing. It broke right there. The, the calcium actually worked like a razor blade. You know, when it, it cut broke, the skin. it yeah. cut. No, no, it cut the shunt. You know, and I didn't know because it, it was drained. And it, was, it just wasn't going where it was going. Yeah. And then I started having like hallucinations and stuff. It took like two weeks wow. for for it to catch up, you know. And then and then I, I never forget because I went to him on Friday before Martin Luther King weekend, and he was like, "All right, I'll see you on Tuesday." And I was like, "You just told me it's broken. <laughs> you just told me you think it happened two weeks ago." All right, okay, see you Tuesday. But the incidence is, is fairly low compared to some of the other problems, but certainly still not true. But I wonder, B, I was 10, you know, you do that same thing, you, you, you grow and you're drinking tons of milk, you, you know what I mean, you're yeah. being a kid. You know, it, it's, it's safe to say the body doesn't like foreign objects in it, mm. and it finds a lot of different ways to attack it and deal with it. You know, there's only a handful of materials that we can use as... Uh, device manufacturers that are sort of inert to the body, silicone, certain types of plastic, um, titanium. You know, you put other things in the body like steel, it'll rust. Um, it's very challenging to make things, you know, um, to withstand the, the, the difficult conditions in the body and make it last for a long period of time. So the engineers are certainly tasked with um, some challenging situations. So this is a fixed pressure valve, as somebody as somebody mentioned. And again, I'll show you a little what the different technology is when we get to the adjustable. So all right, let's actually go to the next one. So when we talk about these fixed pressure valves, we make them in a variety of pressure settings. You'll note that there's a, quite a different um, sets of markings, like a dot with an arrow. The dots and these these black marks on the valves represent they're called radiopaque markings. And they're unique to each valve and each manufacturer. So when a patient goes to a doctor, let's say you're, you know, you forget your patient information, you just don't have it, they can actually identify the valve by doing an x-ray. <clears throat> and there's there's websites on the internet that um, provide all the different shunt manufacturers' valves so that the doctor can identify them. The, the dot marking not only identifies the, um, the manufacturer, but the pressure rating as well. So these are examples of essentially all the same valve, 
in different bodies. You know, you have uh, sort of small ones for pediatrics and larger ones for adults. And one of the most common questions I get is, well, why would you ever want to put a big valve in anybody, right? Wouldn't you always want it to be small? The scalp on an adult gets very thick. It's almost, it can be up to like 12 uh, millimeters thick. And as it starts to get thick, it's, it's difficult to find the valve. So you actually want it a little bit bigger so they can find that reservoir if they need to tap it or, or find it for whatever reason. And so it's important to keep it big enough so they can find it, but small enough so it has good cosmesis and it's not a problem. So, so um, I had uh, my shunt extracted. Uh, they went after the wrong one. They went after an old one <coughs> that was put in 78. It was the one that kept breaking. But they asked me if it was a, a VA shunt, and it was never a VA shunt. It was right. just a, a bigger shunt, you right. know. Um, after seeing the shunt, um, you know, probably for the first time when I was maybe 22 or 23, you know, um, why, why is those, and if we have so many obstructions, you know, I've had the thing replaced so many times for obstructions. Why is those so, so tiny? Why the tube's so tiny? Yeah. Why don't, why don't we just, why don't we just make everything a bigger the gauge? Old, the old ones that lasted longer and were a little bit bigger, you know. Yeah, they could probably make them a little bit bigger, but we don't know if it would make a difference. In other words, you'd have to sort of do a clinical study and, and come up with a bigger set of tubes. And the bottom line is it, try to keep things small enough so that they're unnoticeable, but um, big enough so that they have a, a big enough fluid pathway. Yeah. And so we could go to all this trouble, and we don't know if it would necessarily help. So we kind of wrestle with tiny, them. though. Yeah, they are tiny, and they need to be. I mean, in the end, even if we made the tubes bigger, the pathways through the valve itself are relatively small. Some of them are on the order of a millimeter. And if we make the valve much bigger, then you start to, you start to come up to a size where it um, sort of has cosmesis problems. But as well as if it's too big, it'll actually erode through the skin on the scalp. Right, right. I, I got the Escalap, the lady put it in, and she uh, said she she said I'd be uncomfortable because she made a divot, so. Oh, did inside, and did the in skull a little skull, bit? skull, yeah. so it said that. That's another way to help I'm you with that. That's okay. So if you get one as an infant, do you, like, grow out? You know what I'm saying? Because you say you could, you could have it forever. I know it's not that yeah. likely, but. Yeah, if, if we go to the next slide real quick, and I'll help answer that, is, first of all, they have to choose a size, which isn't the most complicated part. I, I'd say the answer to your question, if the valve's still working, you don't touch it or do anything yeah. with it, right? That's always the first thing yeah. that they would do. But depending on what pressure opening it has, it may need to be changed for that reason. Very often in little babies, um, because the skull hasn't fused yet, they don't build up high degrees of pressure. And so if you were to put a valve with a, a relatively high opening pressure, their, their fluid pressure would never be able to push that valve open to drain fluid. So in, in little babies or preemies, you might put in a valve that has an opening pressure of 20. And so it's a long way of saying, as they're, uh, when their skulls finally fuse, they might start to build up pressures, and the valve would open too easily at 20, and they would be draining off too much. So as a result, you may need to check, change out the valve with respect to um, its pressure rating, not necessarily its size. But the, I think this, the pat answer is, is if the valve is working or you know, the patient's fine, they won't do anything to change it. Does that help answer your question? Was there another one? You talked about instruction. Is there any sort of technology or research to treat the instructions medically, not necessarily replace the shunts or cross the shunts? Like, totally generic terms, but can't you like see some drain away? Kind of like you clog a drain. Like, yeah. Like if, if your pipes are clogged, you put some drain away, you don't know if it's tight. Yeah. Is there any sort of research looking at that with like, how to do the medical therapy? Yeah, I think a different approach has always been how do you how do you stop tissue from growing into it? And there's been all kinds of ideas. In fact, if you do patent searches, you'd be, it's crazy all the stuff that people would come up with. Um, but um, one of the sort of the themes is is um, a rolling stone gathers no moss, right? If something is moving, um, maybe it won't, uh, it doesn't give a chance for the slow process of tissue to adhere to it. And so there's been a lot of patent ideas about putting small little mechanisms inside the shunt that constantly move. Um, 
whether you can make these things or not, again, whether technology is caught up to the point where you can do it is really the question there. And how do you power it? Uh, do you put, again, do you put a battery in a shunt device that doesn't have a battery today? You're fundamentally changing the whole way that we deal with shunts. So those are some of the approaches. Some of the other approaches are to put different coatings on the valve, so coating on the outside of it that makes it appear to the body to make not be as much of a foreign, foreign body as it is today. Make it um, lubricious, slippery, so that things can't stick to it. There's been some approaches. We've even tried a few of them. One of them was a really slippery coating, but in but in the end, we didn't see we didn't see any difference in outcomes. And so that's really where the proof comes: is you try things, but you don't necessarily know if they're going to work. I had to do a, a six-week pick line or a vamp and have to have a shunt infection. And yeah. Then to keep the stuff from growing up. Yeah, I have a slide I'll talk about infections. That's a really good point. And there's a new technology that we've come out to help address that. That's a really great point, Doc. So the next slide is, you know, again, one of the big problems is, is obstruction of the catheter. The other big problem that we dealt with before we had a solution to it was what's called overdrainage. So in other words, CSF goes through the shunt system, but there's a situation when when how shunt systems work when you're lying down <clears throat> compared to how they work when you stand up. And when you stand up, there's something called the siphon effect, which is a very powerful effect which will essentially drain all the CSF out of your ventricles and leave you with a situation what we call slit ventricles. And, and you can see here that there's essentially no ventricle there anymore. It's so tiny. Here's an example of a CT scan with essentially no ventricle. And the problem with that is you need CSF in your ventricles. It's important. But the other problem is when tissue collapses on top of the catheter, now tissue is in contact with the catheter at all times, and it makes it that much easier for tissue to grow into it. It's so not the catheter in the belly or the head. This would only be in the head. The picture is at the end of the, the head of the belly. This is an example, again, that same picture of, of a, a catheter that they took out, oh. and it had the tissue adhered to it. But so this, that's a ventricular catheter. Again, this happens to me. The, the the ventricles collapse around the tip of the shunt. Mm -hmm. You get a temporary occlusion where you're in god awful pain. And you can't see straight or stand up for however long. This is what is called slit ventricle that's syndrome. That's what I've got. Yeah, but when it gets bad, bad, then it collapses around. The, then you get you know you get dry socket. Brain, it just yeah. collapses on the shunt, and then you got to wait for the pressure to build up for it to open up again. And the, and the sad part is, it's sort of a chronic situation, yeah. like Zach's describing. Is is if you're overdrained for a period of time, the body gets used to the fact that the ventricles are empty, and the brain essentially grows inward. Right. And so now there isn't a ventricular space anymore. And if you try to, if you try to stop shunting to build up fluid pressure and build up the ventricles, it can be extremely painful. And headaches, and so it's it's a it's a non-win-win situation. So what we have to do is start with a situation to control over drainage with technology, so that it doesn't reach this point. Because once it reaches this point, it, it creates more problems than than, than it fixes. Uh, yeah, uh, Bruce. Bruce. Without a shunt, does the physical position affect the body? <laughs> the way I understand it, Bruce, is that um, we have a compensatory system within our body that helps prevent this from happening. And I, I don't understand it completely, but it has something to do with the venous system and that when we stand up, it, um, it helps prevent us from essentially draining the fluid from our head. One of, the, one of the ways that it does that is right now the system is completely full. And so it's a bit like a bottle of water, right? If you, if you hold it upright and you hold it sideways, but it's completely full, it really doesn't change the dynamics of the fluid in the system, right? Whereas with the shunt system, we're trying to go outside of the system and create essentially an empty tube that falls alongside of it. And so the properties of siphoning take effect in that artificial system that don't necessarily happen in our natural system. Although the next system may be some variation of the position. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because I noticed my, my situation day to day now. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing is we think sort of that the CSF 
production rate, absorption rate, um, flow through the shunt is, is constant. The fact of the matter is, is, is when they do put sensors in people and measure them over a period of time, whether they're laying down, moving around, it is all over the place. And so it's not easy to really understand that if we put in some sort of automated shunt someday in the future, what on earth do we set it at? Because the fact of the matter is, is ICP itself. is all over the place. Yeah, we'd have it's to get it's gonna set itself. Yeah, it's very, very complicated. Just a, a comment then maybe Tom, my son, he had the um recipe monitor. He did it for three weeks. Uh, what kind of monitor? I spent the cranial moment they was trying to get it, get his pressure. Basically, we were trying to um, we were trying to, to get. He was getting really bad headaches. We didn't know what was causing. We were trying to his shunt settings were one was on one one was at um, two or one point five, and the other one was at two. So his settings were so they were trying to regulate so that both shunts would be at the same settings. Which sure. we finally got it to that point. But it was day to day monitoring where they would just keep adjusting and adjusting one shot and bring in the other one. It's a long process. It worked for us um, where we've got a little bit better control because now they're both at the same settings. But, um, you know, I mean, that was just a process in itself on the ICU to them to be able to do the monitoring. Um, I don't want to have to go through that again. <laughs> but it would be nice to figure it away. I mean, and it's it's sad when he has two shunts and he both he needs them both. Yeah. So anything we need to fix that problem. <laughs> yeah, it, that's a very unique situation of having uh, you know completely separate uh, lateral ventricles that need to be dealt with independently. So it's, excuse me yeah. a second. It's four ten. How far are we in your presentation? Oh, uh, probably about halfway. So we're halfway. I think so. Um, so I think, so right now, in order to get through the presentation, we'll have Tom finish the presentation. Um, we're going to try to wrap it up five, and um, I really encourage anybody that has questions at the end of that, um, we're going to ask those, ask those and questions. And hopefully it'll, some of it will answer some of the questions okay. that you guys are thinking of. I just want to make sure we get through it, you get all the information. But then um, put your lovely hands up for last questions. Yeah, great questions, you guys. So what do we do to fix this? And Medtronic came up with a solution. Um, this, this, again, sort of shows the siphon effect. You have, um, you know, when we talk about a shunt, it's a long tube, right? If I sh grab a bigger tube, which Zach would rather have. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, it's just a siphon, and we know what the siphon effect is, is if you take one end of the tube and you put it in a fluid source, and you take the other end of the tube and you put it below the fluid source, gravity will actually pull the fluid through the tube, right? And so think about a body laying down. It's a shunt. One end is in the ventricles, the other end's in the abdomen. When you're laying down, it's all on the same level, right? It's only when you stand up that you create a siphon effect. And so how do we deal with that from a, a technology standpoint? And the next slide will kind of show you a little bit about how we try to address that. And so when you're laying down, and there's no siphon effect, the only pressures that are working on the valve membrane itself are coming from the ventricles trying to push it open. Okay? But as you start to stand up, the siphon effect, this long fluid column that runs down your body, starts to pull on it. And so, it's, so not only are you getting a, a slight push from the ventricles to push it open, but you're getting a very strong effect pulling fluid as you stand up. The valve is not equipped to stop it. And so if you go to the next slide, I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is the valve mechanism. Fluid is coming from the ventricles. And let's say it has a pressure of about 100. Okay? That's fairly normal. The fact of the matter is, is the siphon effect is essentially a negative 400. And remember, some of the valve numbers that I showed you are a valve rating of like 95, which is 100, meaning it takes, it takes about 100 to, to push this valve open. This valve mechanism can also get sucked open. And so if it's only rated at 100 to stop 100 from pushing it open, it doesn't have a chance against negative 400. And so the bottom line is the original valves as they were designed did not stop the siphon effect. And every time you stood up, CSF would drain out at a, at a tremendous rate. And that's what caused slit ventricle syndrome. Okay. So what we needed to do is say, Let's let the valve continue to do its thing, 
but let's put something on this side of the valve near the peritoneum to stop that siphon effect. What, what kind of mechanism can we put there to stop it? And that's what we came up with, and that's what other companies have come up with. Go to the next slide. Is it something called the delta chamber? So we took our original valve, and we added on a compartment called the delta chamber, and it has a, um, a unique effect to stop the <coughs> siphon effect and let the valve do its work. And if I go to the next slide, I can show that a little bit better. So what it is, you guys, is um, fluid comes from, the, from the, the main part of the shunt into this area right here. And when you're laying down, there's a silicone membrane that sits here on the top and on the bottom. And the fluid pressure from the ventricles can push it open and drain out the back end of the valve without any problem. So when you're laying down, the valve just operates as it normally would. When you stand up, this red area right here represents a very strong suction force. And what happens is, this very small part of the membrane gets sucked in and immediately shuts off the valve. So the siphon effect that's happening below it doesn't have any effect on the valve above it. And so that would be good even if it did that. Even if every time you stood up, it stopped you from overdraining. The problem is, if this thing is being sucked closed, um, the valve can't do its thing and give you drainage as you're walking around for eight hours a day. And so you wouldn't be getting relief. And what would be happening in your ventricles is CSF is slowly <clears throat> building up as you produce CSF throughout the day. And the only way that you could get um, relief is to go lay down. And you've heard that sometimes, go lay down, you'll, you'll feel better. That's, that's what's going on inside valves, right? But what we did is we created a unique situation in that this little circle right here is about 20 times smaller than this large surface area right here. And so what that means is this. When fluid comes from the valve into this big area right here, even a small amount of pressure of maybe 100, because the surface area is so great, it can actually lift up this membrane and overcome the suction that's happening right here. And so by virtue of uh, ratio, ratios and leverage, you're able to drain even when you're standing up. So it essentially stops the siphon effect, but allow little bits of drainage as you're standing up. So it's really an ingenious way that the engineers figure out a way to deal with this fluid dynamic issue and allow people to have a valve system that is as close to natural as we think we can create in an artificial system. And I know that's really complicated, but the takeaway is this, is that when you're standing up or lying down, the valve tends to operate in the same way by virtue of adding on this piece to the valve. Okay? Executive question. Is, uh, is that uh, is your site from adjustable? No, it's not. It works, it works in any situation. Okay? I don't know if that helps. It is, it is complicated. I find it hard to describe, but um, but uh, I think it uh, so can I, can I, I, I don't mean to keep butting in, but I wanted to share this. I've had a few different experiences. I had my peritoneum get infected, and after so many weeks in the hospital of getting antibiotics, and having my shunt uh, externalized, they had to get me out in there. So they put it in my pleura, mm -hmm. which um, is next to your lung. It just surrounds your lungs, and it's like a little capsule feelings, and it's got fluid in it. And um, it's got negative pressure in it. So um, I had a, a codman at the time, and they said it came with an anti-siphon valve and um in the cardman and I'm, I'm pretty active and but as soon as bless you as soon as i would get up in the morning by the time i stood up got to the bottom of the stairs i was in the bathroom throwing up every morning if i was active out and if i mowed the lawn and was huffing and puffing i'm throwing up because i'm i'm just it's all coming out. I, you know, my ventricles are collapsing on the shunt, and I'm just throwing up all the time. So, um, I got the Escalab uh, with the shunt assistant mm -hmm. in it, and instead of having, you know, moving it back to my perineum, which I could have done at that point, just replacing the pots up here, and she uh, 
we, you know, set the the anti siphon at a very, you know, very high rate or whatever. And I, you know, I'm just past three years and I haven't thrown it up once. That's great. I haven't thrown it up in the morning. You know, I can work and 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 it's it's like it's amazing what you know the technology. And you need it. You need it. And they, the Ascalap has a different solution for anti siphoning. Yeah. And you know, we're not saying this is this this is the solve all be all. Right. Other companies it's have come up with some great solutions to to treating this situation and as you know, you never know what's going to work for each individual patient, and sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error. Right. Yeah, that's great. Right. I mean, I mean, I totally had to elect to do that. Yeah. And it was a hard decision to make. Yeah. Because you don't know if it's going to work. Right. And that's that's great to hear that they found a solution for you. Yeah. And I don't have a picture of what their uh, technology is, but I, maybe later I can try to explain how it works. So that's that's the solution that we came up with for anti siphon. And that brings us to adjustable valves. So that, that's sort of the next technology leap that happened. And that's to be able to say, all right, if you put in a valve, you can actually adjust its opening pressure at once it's already in place. And here's an example of Ascilab valve, Codman, and Medtron. And <coughs> hold on, can I just go real back? Real yeah, quickly? go ahead. Sorry. We got to say, we got to talk about the ICP. The, the questions at the end. That little valve that Escalap has is just a pen and when they put it to your head it's got a magnet in it it rolls right around the caliber it tells you exactly what your thing is yep instead of having the, it's amazing yeah and so what we did is we took the valve mechanism that you saw before which was a silicone membrane and we replaced it with something different and it's essentially a ball and a spring valve and here's how it works go to the next slide you have uh, this is a blow up of the valve mechanism and what you have is CSF coming from the ventricles over the top, and there's this ruby ball being held into a cone that's essentially sealed. Fluid pressure has to be greater than the force of, there's a spring down here, pushing the ball up into the cone. And once the fluid pressure from your ventricles is greater, it'll push that ball out of the way and fluid will leak out of the back of the valve. Now how you adjust it is in the next slide, is this rotor, this piece that sits in here, has a magnet in it, okay? And it sits down on the bottom of the uh, valve cassette. This valve cassette is actually a spiral staircase with five steps on it. And based on whether it sits on the lowest step or the highest step, as it goes up the staircase, it's pushing on the spring and the ball that's above it, this piece right here. And so if you're on the highest step, there's a great deal of force pushing the ball into the cone. And if you're on the lowest step, there's less pressure pushing on the, on the ball in the cone. And so it requires more or less pressure to push the ball out of the way to drain out the uh, valve. The way that you adjust it is, on the next slide, is this little magnet in here, you take an adjustment of a magnet outside the head, and all they are is two magnets. And you remember you know, playing with magnets when you were a kid? If you bring two magnets next to each other, they're attracted to each other, right? And so that's what's happening. When you bring the adjustment tool over the top of the head, which is a magnet, the little magnet inside is attracted to it, and as you rotate one outside the head, the mechanism inside the valve is actually following it. And, and what you do is you rotate it around to the setting that you want, the stair step that you want. When you pull the magnet outside the head away from the head, it loses its attraction and it falls into its setting. So that's how the doctor is able to non-invasively adjust the valve without having to go through the skin and do another surgery. And the airport scan has changed that. Say that full, again? The full body hip ones can and they change. No, they percentage. cannot. They cannot. And I'll what show you. What about the, the, the chairs, the um, massage chairs? Because I believe that's what cha changed my sense. It could be. It has <laughs> magnets in it. I'm not too sure. But let me show you. Um, we'll talk a little bit. Go to the next slide. Um, so let's talk about magnets. So it takes a magnet to adjust it, right? Mm -hmm. We also experience magnets in our everyday life, right? And so the question is whether they're strong enough to, to influence the valve. Magnets get very weak with distance. In other words, you can try that. If you take two magnets and you hold them very close together, they get strong when they're right next to each other, but as soon as you give them a little distance apart, they don't have any attraction whatsoever anymore. And that helps us and hurts us. And so basically, we have to start with an adjustment tool that has, just to keep these numbers in relative speaking, with a very, very high Gauss reading, 3,000, because what you need is you need about a minimum of 100 right on top of the valve to be able to adjust it. The fact of the matter is, when a valve's implanted in a patient, you can't get right on top of the valve. 
there's a layer of skin between the valve and the, and the, and the um, magnet. So you need a really high magnet to start with to be able to work through even that small layer of skin because it gets weak very quickly. And so when we talk about um, magnets in your environment, which is the next slide, this is an example of a chart where we took a what's called a Gauss spinner. It's a magnet, magnetometer. And we took it and we put it up against things to see how strong these things are, right? And remember, you need about a minimum of 100 Gauss right on top of our valve to make it work. You need an even stronger magnet just a little distance away to make it work, right? And so most of the stuff in our environment, you talk about like headphones, have a, a rating of 115 right on top of the speaker, right? But even if you get a little distance away, the second column is two inches away, it essentially goes to zero. It has no magnetic strength at all. So this distance right here for almost every single magnet is essentially zero, with the exception of an MRI, which I'll talk about next. There's one exceptional uh, item that we've found in the, out in the world, which is the uh, iPad smart cover. You guys have heard a lot about the iPad, right? The iPad has magnets in, along, its, uh, along its, um, the edge of its binder, and the magnetic cover also has magnets in it. They're exceptionally strong. Apple spent a lot of money on those magnets, or rare earth magnets. And it has more than enough strength to adjust a strata valve, or anybody's valve, if you put it right on top of it. But as soon as you get two inches away, zero. It has no strength. So what does that mean? You can have magnets in your environment. You can have them nearby, but you just have to be cautious. Because for a magnet to be able to adjust anybody's valve, it has to be directly on top of it, and you basically have to rotate it at the same time. So it's just good for you guys to know that, that, that you know, there's, there's these fears because you don't know that, gosh, if my child's in the room with an iPad, is that going to change their valve? The fact that it matters, no. By the, time you, by, the, by the time you get two inches away from it, it has no ability to be able to adjust the valve. Okay. My son obviously has an iPad. He's been getting a lot of headaches. I never thought about the iPad and magnets, but he has it. Like, that's, his, that's his learning tool. So it could be in his head and sometimes he can even fall asleep. You could fall asleep on it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to ask about those, you know, your headsets. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't think I thought the little ones are fun, but then you got to set up those, the bigger ones. Yeah. Um, and Every was, single speaker has a magnet in it, you yeah. guys. So it was like a And think about, you know, where the placement of the valve is. It's, it's yeah. It's almost exactly where it is. Yeah. Will it change it? I don't know for sure. We'd have to measure each individual product to find out whether it would or not. The, my, my recommendation is to use maybe earbuds and put it, unfortunately, on one side of the head, the opposite side of the head that the valve is playing on. That's plenty of distance to be safe. But if you put it right near the ear where the valve is very close, it's maybe less than two inches, there's a small potential that it could adjust. Not necessarily changing, but it may be cause vibration or something? No. Maybe. It either changes or it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why I got it. Maybe I had a god one at the time, but as soon as the iPad 2 came out, I got an email with a warning that said that it could change your setting. It could. It could. If you put it directly so on top of your valve, it could change the valve. Yeah, whether it's Codman's or some of the other ones. But does that help you guys? When you talk about one of the most common things we get is asked about walk through thing. We took a magnetometer and ran it across the entire surface of the thing. It has a, a Gauss reading of 1.5. It's zero. It has no magnetic power. Wands that they used to wand you at the airport don't have any magnetic power. What, what Gauss level does the sensor have to have to change? You have to have about 100 right on top of it. Right on top of it. Literally. So let's say let's say this this thing had a, a rating of 200, but that's touching the magnetometer right next to it. You would need to put your head up against the side of it and somehow rotate your head at the same time for it to get to do anything. So I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but the bottom line is I'm trying to to impart on you that if you get even a small distance away from a magnet, its power goes to essentially zero. The only exception of that is when you talk about an MRI, which is an extremely powerful commercial magnet that can change the valve from even quite a distance away, which is the next slide. So when you talk about, you guys hear these terms a lot, and they're, they're sometimes used interchangeably and sometimes used in the wrong sense. But, but again, for most uh, magnetic adjustable valves, if you go into an MRI setting, you should get the setting of the valve checked as you exit the, the MRI. Just make sure it doesn't necessarily change what it could. And if it does, you want it set back to what it should be, right? Um, 
things that are MRI safe are things that are like all plastic, like some of our fixed pressure valves are all silicone and plastic. There's nothing in them that's metal that's dangerous. What you're worried about in an MRI is if the mass of the metal is big enough, it will actually heat up as a result of the MRI process. If, um, if it's also big enough, it can not only heat up, but it can also move. So you can imagine if you had something implanted into your skin, and if it moved and was attracted to the magnet, it could potentially damage the skin, right? Well, the fact of the matter is for all these valves, the mass of the metal inside the valves are so small that they don't heat up or move. But the condition, they're called conditional, there's one condition, the condition is make sure you check it afterward because it could change the setting of the valve. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll shed some light on what those crazy terms are because you hear these things used interchangeably all the time. And just one more thing I wanted to kind of go over is, you know, we talk about um, things that can go wrong, shunts blocking, shunts calcifying. Another thing that happens that we talked about a little bit is you can get a shunt infection. So one of the things that we came up with, if you go to the next slide, actually skip to, is to take our silicone catheters, our standard silicone catheters, and impregnate it with two different antibiotics. And essentially what happens is the antibiotics are eluding off the surface of the catheter after implantation. Infection typically happens at the time of surgery because microorganisms work their way into the surgical theater via, you know, some unknown, right? And once they get inside the body, the body is a wonderful place for these things to grow and they proliferate and, and they grow out of control. And once you have a shunt infection, you have to take the, the infected shunt out to deal with it. The good news is with, with these new catheters is they provide some, at least some protection to, uh, for up to, up to five months to elude um, drugs off the surface of the catheter to hopefully prevent these infections that happen. And this just shows an example of sort of the, the um, antibiotics coming off the inner and outer surface, so it's going through the CSF and around the outside of the shunt. And lastly, there's just a, a comment about um, the future of shunting. We already talked about a lot of these things, but the next slide is, you know, one of the things that we're, we're trying to look at is what can we do with putting, you know, we talked about putting coatings on the catheters to prevent either obstruction or calcification. Those are some things that are being experimented with. Um, putting in um, technology sensors that measure flow or ICP. Again, what a powerful tool that if the surgeon has that to help determine maybe what setting is appropriate for the patient, whether the shunt is working. So those are some things that are being explored as we, as we look at different technologies. There's a lot being done with uh, pharmaceuticals. You know, Is there going to be a pill someday that helps regulate how much CSF we produce and, and get it to a level that um, helps um, be more normal? So those are some of the things that, that, that I think are being researched right now and being worked on. It's sort of, I'd love to tell you everything that's being done, but there's also a little bit of secrecy as well that you can't always tell um, all the things that we're doing, but hopefully it gives you some idea that um, there is investments being made and, and um, it's going well. I think we'll skip this one. And lastly, I just wanted to end sort of on a high note before I take more questions for you guys. You know. I'm here to learn more from you and, and, and spend time with patients and, and, and understand the struggles that you guys go through and hear directly from you. You know, we hear a lot of stories because we're always in contact with a lot of physicians and, and patients. And this is an extreme case that, uh, a story that really touched my heart, but a baby that was born in one of these developing areas of Haiti, born with hydrocephalus. And because the treatment path there isn't very good, it reached this extreme place of, um, you know, where the head gets so big. I mean, this, this poor little baby, it was such in a bad situation that she couldn't even close her eyes at night to sleep anymore because of the extreme pressure on her head. I can't even imagine um, having to live like that. Um, sadly, she had progressed so, so far along that um, when physicians came to visit to do uh, surgeries and do missionary work, um, she wasn't a good candidate. You know, they have maybe 20 shunts and they're gonna try to pick kids that might have a better chance, right? And she was so far along that they were saying, well, you know, I just, we don't want to waste that precious shunt on maybe somebody that might do better. And that's a tough decision to make. Um, as a result of, you know, the baby's physical appearance, you know, there's a stigma associated with that. They think the baby's possessed or, or something along those lines. And as a result, the mother, I think, abandoned her twice. And, um, 
And so the, the good part of the story, this is where it starts to get better, is uh, she was rescued by this young lady named Sarah Kong, who, um, who was doing some missionary work there. And, and what I find interesting is she decided to um, take this upon herself to help this one child, and yet she's seen so many child children in the same situation. But she took this little baby under her wing and, and um, was able to get a temporary visa for her, brought her back to the United States, was able to find um, a physician in Florida that would help her, got a shunt put in. Um, she immediately started to respond. Her head decreased in size. She started to gain weight and thrive. And then the next slide you can see, um, it's really good to see she's doing really well. Wow. And, uh, you know, Sarah has it. You ever, you know, you guys have your own stories and you guys got a lot going on. But if you want to follow other stories, you know, there's Sarah has a Facebook page and, and she puts up uh, reports every day about how little Nika's doing. And, and one of the biggest updates is she got her visa extended. And so Sarah's working to adopt her and take uh, full parental control. But it's um, a great story. I always, I always like to share things like that. So. That's what I have for you guys today. Um, Thank you, Tom. Happy to take your questions. I just, I just have a question. Who's here for the first time today? So, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. I, my daughter has hydrocephalus. My wife Sue. That's that's why we're coming here, and this is an opportunity to learn from um, people who are dealing with this all the time. But is it is there? Um, is there anyone who hasn't been able to ask a question um, that maybe we didn't cover something that you wanted to talk about or because um, it's uh, 4 30 good job and yeah. so we have a half hour right to uh, to talk and whether it's talking about ourselves or, or asking questions is there anybody who hasn't asked a question yet but the new shunt, what are the lights there? My shunt is turning five next month. So I'm just concerned that it gave us a five year mark. What's this head on it? I, th I think, I don't know the exact statistics off the top of my head, but I think the longer you go out, the better, the better sort of the um, prospect is that it'll continue to work. And well. so. You know, I, I don't obviously don't want to give false hope or anything along those lines, but I think that the early periods, especially for kids, the early periods are the, are the toughest part to, to get past. And once you get past some of those time periods, um, success seems to be better. Do you guys, between Medtronic, Codman, you know, S Club, um, who's the other one? Sophisa. Um, do you guys? I know it's obviously a competitive market, but do you share information? Yeah, I think I think the easiest way to answer that, Zach, is is um, the physicians have sort of a non-biased um, attitude to this whole thing, right? right? They work independently of us. We, you know, there's it's taboo to pay a surgeon to use your products, kind of thing. Right. And so they're doing a great deal of research, and I think to answer your question is, we go to conferences many times a year and. You know, we'll have an exhibit table and be showing our products. But we're also hearing them discuss all the research they're doing. And I think it's we see research on uh, using competitive valves. We see research using our valves. We see research not using valves. And so there's a there's a great deal of flow of information of all the research and things that are going on. And they're posted in you know the neurosurgical journals, like right. Journal of Neurosurgery. So there's it's it's truly amazing all of the things Nobody's that are being done. No. <laughs> I was just wondering your opinion on your shunts and sports. For I have a 17-year-old son who we told him he couldn't play hockey anymore, which was the love of his life. Yeah. We forced him to be a goalie, which lasted for a while. Um, but now as a senior in high school, we let him start playing again. Um, Sometimes it feels a little bit irresponsible, but I just was wondering your opinion. But our neurosurgeon said he can do anything he wants except screw yeah. that, but I Yeah, I mean, shunt, I think the simple answer is shunts are not indestructible. Right. And so, you know, depending on the force that gets applied to it, it could damage it. But that being said, um, you know, 
you know, you wear helmets, the helmets have contact points in them. It could fall on the valve, it could not fall on the valve. Um, I think you got to live your life, right? The good news is, is that shunt surgery is, 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 is probably one of the most um, rudimentary procedures that neurosurgeons do. It's fairly routine. And so if something did happen to it, they can replace it. So, I, I, but I would, I would always defer to the neurosurgeon uh, as to what their recommendation is for that particular situation. Yeah. And what about flying? Pressure changes flying. I know it's supposed to have no effect whatsoever. It doesn't because it, it happens to your entire body. And so, if if it, let's say your abdomen was to to pressurize at a different level than your head, it would create a differential and cause issues. But the bottom line is, your whole body is exposed at the same time, and so it creates. Um, it doesn't create a differential. That's correct. What are your slides said a forty percent failure rate? Yeah, it's actually Does six. Do they not um, don't work? Why? Why so high? Why so? Yeah, it's it's really an astounding number when you think about it. It's just uh, it's it's a combination of a lot of things. One is obstruction of the catheter <coughs> step. Um, they fail because of infection. They fail because of um, calcification of the catheter. They fail because the catheter pulls out of its intended location, whether it's in the ventricle or out of the abdomen, the body doesn't like a foreign object. And so it's it's amazing how, you know, suffice it to say that the body sort of fights it and doesn't, doesn't want this here. Brooks? Yes. Uh, what about the and had a shunt to remove some spinal fluid. The fluid was zilch. Uh, they said I was going to candidate for a shunt. Any other alternatives? You know, we were, I, Sue or Jennifer, was I talking to one of you guys about, you know, there's there's also been talk about doing an ETV, ETV. endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is basically going into the brain with an endoscope and creating a new pathway for the fluid. So. Um, fluid is in flowing the way it should. They're creating an alternative pathway without putting it in a foreign object. Um, there's there's been small experimentation with that. There's been some papers written on it, but it's it's not very conclusive that what patients it works well in and why. So in other words, they have got gotten it to work in, to really make sure that it's it's the right thing to do and it's better than a shunt because you always want to choose the right therapy that um, has the greatest, um, the highest outcome. So there's been some experimentation with that, but that's really the only alternative that I know. I think uh, yeah. Bridget had a question. Um, I just personally just went through a period of time, about two months where I overtrunted, mm -hmm. and now the settings have been changed in a week, so it's fairly new. But my question is, will there be, or is there a point to be working on where there's some kind of alarm system or something that says, hey, right, Something's going wrong here. Something wrong. Yeah. Is that for me is the most difficult part of being trunk patient? You really have to know your body. Yeah. You really have to know what's going on in there. You don't know what's going on in there. Yeah. Which one I, I, I tried. It took me a little bit longer because I'm only ever always under trunking, never over. So both my revisions were under trunking. This time my ventricles were collapsing in. And the feeling, the, the pressure feeling was there. That was the same. But nothing else. No other symptoms. So of course I pushed myself and did what I did. Finally, said, "Okay, I can't. What's going on?" And um, a simple CT showed that I was in major trouble. Yeah. Is there a possibility? Of I think the, the first step is to put sensors in the shunt okay. that actually measure something, sure. and then once you're getting information back, you have to figure out a way to be able to. Um, I don't know if it's an alarm or if it's something you check on a regular basis, and and sort of have a download or a dump of information to an external device that either goes to a physician for their analysis, or maybe something you analyze. But the technology is starting to evolve where that's happening. There's some, including in Medtronic, there's some technology sensors that they're able to put in the body that um, can can be interrogated externally with different devices. I mean, and so it it's all got to come together. Okay. Even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, I'm just really happy to know that somebody else yeah, it's headed that way. Help. You know, Bridget, I, I have a question. So being a dad of someone with hydrocephalus, um, I'm used to my daughter coming to us with symptoms, and then there is a conversation 
about about what's going on. As I'm thinking about my daughter getting older, you know, who is she going to talk to? Do you have do you have that that team of people around? Because I heard you say I kept pushing myself. I kept pushing myself. Um, my family, I love them dearly, but unfortunately, they're very they're very afraid of this. Um, so it's really me, as I said in my start and I said it. You know, you know your body. Yeah. You know when something's wrong, even before I do a CT. Or sometimes what happens with me is they'll do all the uh, neurological tests, and I pass with flying colors, and I'm failing. And he says, "You're so difficult. You're a difficult patient." And I get frustrated because I'm in help. But um, I guess where I'm going with this is, she's she'll hopefully learn or know as I'm learning. I'm going to just feel different. One one of my hopes for this this um, this chapter here, I think one of the reasons we're doing this, is so that you guys have people who know, and you can talk about that. So um, that you have phone numbers. I mean, Jen has a contact list. So because, like you said, people who don't know don't know, but the people that are sitting around here um, as they go through experiences start to develop trust and be able to talk to each other. Like, am I crazy if I go to the doctor right now and get a CAT scan? Um, and uh, so it's like, and you, you, Bruce, hearing today, ETV. My daughter had nine surgeries in one year, and we felt, do we act, is there something else? And so you just heard, there's this thing called ETV, and, and to check that out. But uh, any other questions? I, I, I want to I have one going back to sports and children. So my daughter's 18. And when she was nine, she started gymnastics. She loved it, but at the end of every session, I mean, they do handstand, she had a terrible headache and she ended up withdrawing after two months. So she just couldn't do it anymore. But fast forward to high school, she wanted to join the gymnastics team. And I, I just, I said no, because I remember those awful headaches yeah. she had every time. So we argued about it. But I'm, I'm asking you, I'm, on the one hand, it seems like it's a closed system, there are no air bubbles. Um, um, it doesn't seem like if you're going upside down and back again that it should change, and yet it is a tube, an artificial tube. And I, I can't help thinking if you're turning a tube with fluid up and down that it, something might happen. But I, I don't know. Do you do you think it was the inversion that kept that were causing these terrible headaches? It could be. You know, we think about it. Bruce asked about. You know, in our natural system, the system is completely full. So when you turn it upside down or turn it, it really doesn't have an effect on it. Yeah, so it depends on the situation, but um, whereas the point about the, the, the shunt system is externalized to that system, it has an open end on either end. And so, so gravity does have an effect on it, which I was trying to explain before with the siphon effect. But you need, you need to know that all valves on the market are one-way valves. So fluid will be affected by a vertical column that goes this way, but if you were to, to go upside down, it wouldn't have the same effect because gravity is now forcing back toward the shunt system and the valve can't open the other way. And so, and it's not really answering your question, but tumbling around is creating not only um, a, a vertical column, which would cause a siphon effect, but there also might be some, some, some centrifugal force that could accelerate that. I don't know. I was thinking something like the swimming, because I know it's in a diving, but my son used to love to Flip into the pool and do a pool, and he would do it. And then after a while, he would just his head, he would just have some crazy headaches. Yeah, and, and all we had to do was let him kind of just give him time so his body could kind of regulate again. And that's like, no, so you can't do that. You know what happens if you stop, you know, what's the flips in the pools and so forth. And, you, know, you might be, be creating forces stronger than the siphon effect by spinning. It's possible. So. Oh, uh, I, just, I swear I've seen you do a name before. Do you have other things that your company makes other than Yeah, Medtronic is a, is a big corporation in medical devices, and it was really founded on uh, pacemaking technology, heart technology, okay, yes. but they've since diversified into areas of the spine, Quadri diabetes. What's that? You get the quadriplegic to be able to move with his thoughts, right? Well, I don't know about that. Well, no, uh, maybe, like, but... He'd be able to move. He'd get the device on his head and he can move some of his limbs that are not retronic. I mean, we might be doing that too. I, I mean, it's 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 a big corporation with, um, I think, gosh, 
Um, I want to. I wanted to say something about Sue. Sue, um, with sports, I was always told as a kid not to do contact sports. Um, I had no desire to do football. I wasn't a jock. I loved to skate and do hockey. And my father, he couldn't stop me. So he took my helmet and he put he took finger paint and he put it all over my shunt. And then he put the helmet on me. And then he took it off and he cut the padding out. He said, because then when you're getting hit, there's nothing hitting you because it's the inch of space or whatever. And I always wore my helmet like that and I played hockey until I was eight months. I met a problem. A solution for, we have a son, you know, 50 ish, but he wanted to play contact sports. He also did other sports. And I told him, you do no contact sports. It's not worth the risk. You are good at these others. He then excelled at cross country skiing when he was So don't do them, period. I'm not a big engineer, but what I can tell, the impact is not worth the risk. No. There's a lot of choices that you could do. I mean, you could do some sports that, like you said, that are just a little lot less impact. Than... You could get a child to buy into that. Yeah. Know, right, right, right. They just want to get stuff. Oh, and he's doing all the stuff. I mean, he literally came back down and started doing like jump, came back. He had his helmet on and hit his head. I, we didn't even know there was this ship that a couple of days later developed a uh, fluid bubble, realized that he shot at the Richter. So, and that's what a helmet. So. Yeah, we don't, you guys, we don't do impact testing. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? So they, aren't, they aren't designed to. Um, you want to take a <laughs> smash them with a hammer after? I mean, we probably could. So it got Lois this question. Is it common or are you aware of people having problems with? It's um, moving around a lot, yeah. poking um, things down there. It's like crazy. Pain. It's crazy. I've seen pictures from physicians showing, you know, as you move your body, things can move and slide, and 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 they can pull out of their position. They found cat. They found the entire peritoneal catheter up in a patient's neck before, and it just happened naturally from moving, because maybe it wasn't tethered. Are right. they designed to move, or are they tethered? In? <laughs> They're supposed to be sewn in. To a certain extent, they use a special type of suture that goes around the, um, the catheter, and then they suture it to tissue. But the suture string isn't so tight that um, it cuts off the fluid flow. I thought it was designed to move. It's designed to move a little bit, but you don't want it to back out of its position um, where it's located. Um, I get up under my diaphragm. It can cause stabbing pain in the shoulder. Yeah, it needs to be. They shoulder. just explained that on HA. The they just explained that. No, I blow this at me. No. Yeah, I don't know why you're stopping me. I Googled it. They just exported right. it on HA. They, they migrate. They get it. Yeah. Let's uh, give a hand to Tom. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Co chairs of the Boston Chapter of Hydrostatic Association would like to talk to us. Just have a little housekeeping note. So, <coughs> our next meeting is May 22nd. Not sure what we're doing yet, but that's our next meeting. And June 16th through 19th is the national conference. So anyone new today, or maybe new to the Hypercephalus Association, every two years they have a national conference. This year it's in Minneapolis, and there'll be tons of speakers. You can go online and find out what the different topics are that they're covering. But it's a really, really wonderful opportunity to, to you know, a lot of people here probably attended them there. It's an incredible opportunity. What are the dates? Uh, June 16th through 19th. And also, if you, in case you don't know, we have a Facebook page. Uh, so if, you ever, if you use Facebook, you go to State of Massachusetts Hydrocephalus Association. Uh, or, yes. Um, and we post a lot of information on that page. And the Hydrocephalus Association has lots of information. And in fact, this, is that still video? Is that a live thing? Hi, and I can see myself. I don't want to be. Hi. <laughs> okay. This this ends our first webcast for the Boston Hydrocephalus Association. Anyway, if if you have friends or if you want to go over some.